I'm Swapin Bharti and we are here at the Open Stack Summit in Vancouver, Canada and we have with us Margaret today. Uh, I think after looking at your shirt that, uh, <laughs> that diversity is a topic that is close to your heart. It is. It's close to my heart also. Uh, when we look at the term diversity, it means, may, means a lot of things. It does. So what does it mean for you? That's a great question. And actually, I was just at a luncheon for mm -hmm. diversity and inclusion. We talked about this exact thing, which mm -hmm. is what is diversity? And so often we immediately just go to gender, exactly. right? Are you male or female? But in my mind, diversity means a lot of different things. Gender, age, um, we talk about sexual orientation, but it also, I think, can mean the way you work, your, your, your skill set, your work style, your personality, um, maybe even uh, the way you think about life, your perspectives, um, the way you do things, right? And so I think when we think about diversity, how we bring in different cultures, different points of view, different different styles and different genders. Mm -hmm. All of that, I think, has a lot of um, influence and, and ability to improve how we work together, how we build teams. And what we know is that using all those different forms of diversity has a positive business impact. And there's been lots of research that has shown that. You, you also operate in open source world. Mm -hmm. uh, and open source world means uh, Anybody can contribute. That's from right. anywhere. I was talking to Kelsey Hightower and he said the reason he yep. loves open source is that uh, it doesn't matter what his background is. He doesn't have to prove himself right. before getting involved. He can. Uh, but even in open source world, we see this problem. Yeah, we do. And I, I think that goes to the inclusivity mm. of diversity, right? We love right. saying D&I together, but you've got diversity is just a definition of these different types of people, you know, and, and how we recognize them as being diverse, right? Or diversity in a situation. Inclusivity or inclusiveness is that ability where everyone that is diverse feels accepted mm -hmm. and feels like they can be included in something. Right. And I think in open source, in theory, it is a level playing field, mm -hmm. right? Um, but in practice, that hasn't happened. And so I, I think the key reason for that is around how you define community and how you do allow anyone to be included. I mean, first of all, in an open source community, there's there's an automatic kind of point of entry, which is, are you technical? Can you code? Right. right. So take that even out of it for a moment. Um, I don't think we've done enough to intentionally encourage um, a more diverse community. So you can say anyone's welcome, but the problem is the 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 traditions or the, the origins of open source have been a very male dominated and Western male dominated culture. Let's just put it that way. Right. Um, which means to change that and to expand that community and provide that same level playing field for anyone across diverse environments is gonna take more intention than just saying it's there. And I think that's where the biggest debate is in this whole DNI thing is how much intention is required to change. And, and do we care if we change? Right, like what's wrong with it now? Maybe we're doing fine, um, but I would submit that I think that we could do more to encourage, enable, invite mm -hmm. a more diverse element to every community, including OpenStack and other open source communities. And how do we do that? Uh, and really, you know, again, I think it's intentional. I think yeah. first of all, you've got to say. Um, okay, what would we do to be more intentional? Do we go to other countries and actually talk right. to people? Do we even go into universities in these different countries and cultures and talk mm -hmm. to the students? So it would actually take um, actions um, because it means people aren't even searching for these things. They may not even know it exists, right? In some culture, it may not even be something that you're aware of. Right. Um, and then there's some things we can do just like we already are doing in OpenStack and in some other open source communities where we are recognizing the need. We are holding you know, community meetings about diversity. We may have project teams around diversity. So I think there's lots of different levels of activities or initiatives that we can do. But regardless, it does take intention. Right. It's not build it and they will come because we know that just hasn't worked. But why, why should we care about diversity? Why? I, I mean, you get best people, they're working on it, why should we care? But are you getting the best people? Yeah, I mean, look at all the technology, they're like great. Absolutely, but you actually don't know if that's the best, mm -hmm. right? You don't know what's hiding in the corners. And I, I think what it comes down to is, regardless if you look at diversity as just different styles or different skill sets or actually different cultures and genders, over and over again, research has actually given us data 
that shows when you have teams that are more diverse, and especially if they are more multicultural and gender diverse, they perform better. Um, so it used to be just theory, where we'd say, oh, it, it's going to make us feel better, or it's just the right thing to do. So let's just say that's enough, right? It's just the better thing to do for society. But we actually now have data over and over again. I mean, I could, I could show you reams of data from McKinsey to academics to you name it, that shows that diverse teams perform better. Um, those companies have better financial results. Um, you know, you have better retention and on and on. So I think it's because we are going to get better results. We're going to get new perspectives, which leads to better innovation and we'll have greater success. Right. Uh, because uh, uh, different cultures, people, uh, they look at things differently. They have different right. languages. Uh, uh, they exactly. solve they solve problems differently. Exactly. And they uh, so so when you put those mixed together, right. instead of solving the same problem in the same way, exactly, you just never know. As you said, you know, you never know. Right. So I there mean, might be a hidden gem of an right. idea that you just you don't come from that perspective. If, yeah. And it might even be something simple, like how do we make sure, you know, that that OpenStack works in a highly geographically dispersed, localized. Unicode enabled environment. I don't know. I'm just kind of making that up, but I'm just saying there, there's things that if someone is coming from Japan or someone's coming from Pakistan, just the way you need to do business or the way the financial market works or the way um, IT security um, has to be deployed, they're going to bring that perspective and it's going to have attributes that are complementary or that help the global community. And without that, you don't know what you don't know. Right. Right. We don't know the questions to ask because yeah. we don't deal with it. So that, mean, that's what yeah. I would say. I mean, if there's no Steve Jobs, you know, there won't be any iPhone and a whole web, you know, cloud based. You know, right. It, it, but you don't know what was around I, Steve I, Jobs, I, yeah, right? Yeah. What was the ecosystem around exactly. him that yeah. allowed him to do it? Uh, and uh, uh, at that point, I was talking to Brian Mellendorf, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. he's kind of legend. In a, and he was like, you know, if uh, it, it was about the sustainable, sustainability of an open source community. And he, mm -hmm. he said that, you know, if your community does not look like the global community where we live in, Right. It will not sustain and it will not survive. That's right. Uh, and that's true. You know, it has to be. Uh, but, but and, and I think the OpenStack community, one thing I will say in, it, in, its, in its favor or, or complimentary is they have been global right. since almost the beginning. And mm -hmm. if you even just walk around right. this event, you see more diversity than you do at most open source right. community events, right? right? And that I think that has been very intentional. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they have um, the event in a global um, diverse location, you know, every year. Um, so there has been some really positive intentional stuff that they have done here. Uh, but I did not see that many keynotes which were from a diverse group of people. Mm, ah, now you're, you're sticking on something that is actually interesting. So we talked about this and, and you hear this a lot where in every community you have different types of voices. Mm -hmm. And I think right now in the technology industry, let's, let's take even open source out of it for a moment. The loudest voices is how I would say it, um, or the most powerful voices are still mostly white male. Right. Um, I think that is changing, mm -hmm. but again, it's not enough just to say we need more people submitting speaking abstracts. That's mm -hmm. going to take change in leadership at organizations. Right. Right. Because right? they're coming from the organizations that are feeding into this. Um, but it also takes more people willing to take a risk. Um, and that really hasn't changed much in the 25 years I've been in tech. I mean, I've been speaking at industry events for a long, long time, and I've pretty much been used to being the one woman right. or one of two women um, on the keynote stage or giving a session for a long time. So we're not doing enough to change that. Right. And I, I, you know, today at the luncheon I said, what if each one of you submitted a session? You know, and, and many people in the room just kind of immediately looked down. And right. I was like, why are you looking down? Mm -hmm. Like all of you bring exactly. something you can share. Right. And I think that's a deeper issue. You're mm -hmm. right. It's, it's how do we get everyone realizing that regardless of their experience or their expertise or their perspective, there is something that you have every single person I've ever met in my entire life that you can share and others can learn from. Mm -hmm. That's true. It's whether you identify it. I mean, I learned from my son who is only six. Uh, Absolutely. Every, yeah. And that's what I say. I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I have mentors who are 25 years old. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, because they've just had a different life experience. How to change the environment so that they are able to look up instead of right. looking down? So I guess part of it is I feel responsible that we have to, those of us that, that have done it or can do it, need to keep doing it, right? Because the thing that I get told from other women is it was so nice to see you on stage, 
right? And so we have to continue to provide them with a role model. The other thing I'll tell you, because I mentor a lot of women in tech and men in tech, and you know, I'm always encouraging them to push themselves. It's like, okay, you're an expert in this. Like there's a woman I mentor who knows Kubernetes very, very well. She'll create the presentations. She will help someone else, you know, get ready for a presentation. And then a man colleague will present the content. Right. So my, my question to her is, why aren't you doing that? You know this content and this technology as well, if not better, mm -hmm. than those people are on stage. Mm -hmm. And she says, well, I don't have the credibility. I don't have the title. I don't. And, and a lot of women will, will always come from that, that position of scarcity um, as opposed to coming from, I'm good enough, and so I'll do it. And so oftentimes I'll encourage them, okay, what if you started with a webinar? Would you be comfortable with that? Where, where somehow that virtual <laughs> environment is a little bit less intimidating. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just going to take all of us just continuing to support, encourage, coach. Mm -hmm. um, and it means that I think when they are on stage that people give them, you know, um, support right. um, and encouragement. And right. I, I wish I could, I, I don't have the, the panacea for this. You know, I don't know why it's so hard for so many people, but a lot of it is just, you know, people that are, that are in this industry sometimes don't have loud voices. You know, some of us are introverts and, and quiet. And so it's kind of getting outside of that skin. Right. to be able to do that. Right. Actually, I liked you know, this uh, Red Hat Summit. Mm -hmm. There was uh, one keynote which was in Spanish. Yes. Because I was talking to Beth Cohen uh, yeah. last year, and she was like, you know, that it's not just about bringing diverse voices, it's about making them comfortable. That's right. When you bring people from different countries or cultures. And you make them speak English. Make them right. speak English. I mean, I interviewed some people from China, mm. and they are the brightest people, right. but they were not able to answer the questions because I was not speaking their language. That's they are right. the best of the best lot, but right. they cannot share. I mean, I cannot share my ideas in German That's right. or any other. So do you think that when you do bring people from different backgrounds or different regions, or you should allow them to be themselves? That also helps? Absolutely. I mean, I, that's just foundational to me. It's like the only way people can let their individual light shine in any situation is when they can be fully themselves. Um, we do have the unfortunate um, or fortunate advantage for those of us that speak native English that, mm -hmm. you know, the world has kind of become a very English centric um, environment. But I think we've got to be more sensitive to that. I mean, I, I will tell you that um, I've gone to China a couple times to speak and I speak enough Mandarin Chinese to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. But when I go there, I attempt to do as much as I can mm -hmm. in Mandarin out mm -hmm. of respect for the fact that that is the language of where I am. Mm -hmm. And if I switch to English, you know, I make sure that we've got translation and I'm incredibly apologetic because yes. I, who am I to go in there and say, okay, you all have to understand me now because right. I can only speak English and you probably speak 12 languages. But that's a global issue. I mean, I, I think that there, we need to continue to, to realize that you know, someone not speaking fluent English has nothing to do with their capability. Right. But unfortunately, in the Western yes. world, we still tend to, you know, do that. So that that's just got to be an ongoing, I think, work where we continue to respect those different cultures, those different languages, and figure out a way to have that communication um, so that people can be fully themselves mm -hmm. and, and use their words um, without it being, you know, a crutch or, or something that we, we deny them of. Right. I don't want to talk about them, but I'm talking about them just because they are also part of the problem. Okay. Uh, people who oppose diversity. Hmm. Right. Uh, whenever, uh, because I cover Are there people who oppose diversity? <laughs> that yes. just sounds funny. Like people are, are actually saying, I am not in support of diversity. Yes. They okay. were like, oh. Uh, this is all social whatever, ah, and, then, what and okay. then at the same time they're like we don't want quotas for women or we don't, if you're good at job and do that. I do so, hear that a lot. I, I, I don't I, think I, I don't think those people are. I necessarily... get beaten up a lot about because I cover diversity a lot. Of, okay. I get beaten up a lot about that. Uh, so uh, you cannot change people's mind for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, if we fine tune the messaging. Sometimes people don't realize, I think you're going to touch upon that, they don't oppose the diversity. So sometimes if we just refine the message in a way right. that they do realize that this is what we are trying to do. So a lot of people, they support, hey, it should be, it should be the best person. It doesn't matter whether it's women or... Sorry. Yes, but here's the problem. Yeah. You can only say that if the pipeline, so to speak, is diverse. Exactly. Right? So there's a, there's a funnel problem, you could say, right? So if at the top of the funnel, let, let's say I'm taking it from a recruiting standpoint, mm -hmm. whether it be a community or a company or whatever. If the top of your funnel is full of diverse candidates and then you're hiring the best people, 
you can absolutely say that you don't need numbers and you know, quotas or whatever. But most of the time, we are not even reaching out and trying to create a funnel that is diverse. Right. Right. So my challenge to everyone is that part has to be intentional. Right. You have to say to your recruiters, to your leadership, to your team, you know, we want to um, find, encourage, recruit. I mean, and that's intentional. Right. You've got to you've got to look for that. And once you start doing that, you find that you end up getting more diverse candidates organically because that reputation starts to spread. Right. But in the beginning and for quite some time, because we're just not there yet, it has to be more of an intentional um, action to to fill your pipeline with diverse candidates mm -hmm. and encourage them and, and then actually study it to see if you've got enough people at the top of the funnel right. and you're still ending up hiring non-diverse candidates, then somewhere in that pipe, it's breaking down, mm -hmm. right? Because I can't believe that if you had 25 people of all genders and cultures, that every time a white male would end up being the best person for the job. Mm -hmm. That's probably not likely, mm -hmm. just, just from pure statistics, right? Mm -hmm. So if that's happening, then you've got to ask yourself, okay, what are we missing? Something's happening as those candidates flow through and we're ending up still hiring people that look like everybody else or act like everyone else. Um, and I'm sure there's times where that candidate would be the best person, but right. it's not going to be 100%. Right. Um, but it all depends on how much you are looking for diversity and willing to take that extra step to find those people. I, I was talking to some companies around how they recruit people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, a lot of companies uh, said that uh, kind of blind hiring, you know, I don't want to know right. the name of oh, the person. Oh, they look at the resumes without the names. Uh, no right. names, no gender, no ethnicity. And I just look at, you know, what you're doing and that's right. what. D will that also help? But at some point, somebody will be. I was going to say, that helps yeah. at the top of the funnel, right? Mm -hmm. So that absolutely, we, we know from, from data, helps in getting that initial pool of candidates. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you've got to talk to them. Exactly. Right. And and that's so that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. So if you do that initial and you bring in people that maybe you would have missed because your right. unconscious bias would have I was got rid of that. To, yeah. But at some point, if you still end up with the same result, then you know there's there's behaviors, there's biases that are happening, conscious or unconscious, um, and probably training that you need to do within your teams so that that's not constant, the same results not happening every time. What exactly unconscious bias? How does it do uh, that? It, so the difference between conscious and unconscious bias is, I mean, people, when they are showing bias, they know it. Mm -hmm. You know, like if, if I was meeting with you and I had a problem with someone that was not American and not white. I'm American. Or, right. Okay, whatever. Sorry. I, okay, Sorry. I was trying to, I was bias trying is gone. <laughs> my point is that if I, if I have in my core values things that I don't like about some people, those are conscious, right? Like mm -hmm. I know them. Right. And I'm, and I'm going to act those out. But many times we think we are completely unbiased and unprejudiced and, um, you know, colorblind and gender blind, you know, all these words people use that are like, oh, I don't, I don't see gender, I don't see color, whatever. But there's something in the back of your mind that if you have three people in front of you, your unconscious bias is to immediately be attracted to something that either looks like you, acts like you, right? It may not be a color thing, it may be a personality what thing, right? Whatever it is. And, and that is typically unconscious. I don't mm -hmm. think those people are honestly saying that I don't want to hire you because you look or act differently than me. It's just, it, there becomes this unconscious comfort. Um, and, and the reason unconscious bias is such a large discussion mm -hmm. is because we know that's often what's impacting the end result mm -hmm. more than the conscious bias. Right. Right. Because I, when you said people are against diversity, I, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's some people, but I've never heard anyone, oh, I'm against diversity right. or I'm, right. you know, I don't think we should have diverse candidates or a diverse community. Um, but it's when it actually goes into implementation, there's things that happen along the way. So there's not one answer to that. It's, it's going to take, like I said, actions at the top, in the mm -hmm. middle, at the end, mm -hmm. training all the way through. Um, because people, I think humans just in general, mm -hmm. we have something that makes us say, oh, that looks and acts like me. I'm going to go to that. Right. Right. And it, it takes people getting out of their comfort zone. I mean, I mean, I will just tell you personally, what helped me a lot is I lived in Asia for nine years. Mm -hmm. um, and it completely, I, I was someone that looked and acted differently than everybody else. Right. Um, and what that did is I was enabled to look at my country from the outside in. Mm -hmm. I was able to be a person that was in the vast minority, not right. just color, but I was a foot taller than most people, which mm -hmm. I stood out everywhere I went. I was female and mm -hmm. leading a company. Right. So the more that we get people to get out of their comfort place, they then have more 
empathy. Right. And, and stop, I, I think, seeing people as, as everything that looks the same. Right. Or at least that's been my experience. So, uh, to, I mean, I don't know if you can really uh, solve the problem, but what are the, I mean, because you work in the field, mm -hmm. uh, to help people realize that they have a, they won't realize they have a bias, right. but how to kind of, uh, in a very subtle manner, kind of solve or fix it. So, solving unconscious bias is hard. I mean, I, I think it goes to what I said, which right. it, it's just going to take just continual training. And I think just talking about it helps, right? Because by who talking... Do talk, who do you talk to? Because Everyone. Of, because you don't realize that you have a bias, so you don't want to talk about it because I, I'm not a biased person. Why should I talk about no, it? No, but I've realized I am. So I'll give you a perfect example. Mm -hmm. I think I am the most, you know, all those words that we say, you know, mm -hmm. colorblind, genderblind, blah, blah, blah. And yet... I know... You're biased, I know that. I know I'm biased, everyone is. It's, it's human <laughs> well, nature, you, right? You can't be um, unbiased. Yeah, I'm biased to... Uh, I'll give you an example. Like, I have some very um, uh, young people on my team that think very differently, and I find myself some, sometimes thinking, oh my God, these millennials, you know, how do you manage them? And then I'm like, <laughs> did I just say that? Because that's bias, right? And I'm putting a judgment on them right. because of their age and because of the way they're acting, which to me seems odd, right? right? However... It is unfair for me to judge them for that because maybe they're doing something because of their core values or their experience, right? Now, I do know I intentionally brought young people onto the team because we noticed that we were all getting too much to be the same age. Right. And so uh, on my team, we, t we talk about this all the time. It's like we need you know, people from every generation. We need people from all the different cultures. We need to have people of different perspectives. We need people that all have different working styles because if everyone was like me, that would be a problem, right? Um, we would just go, 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 and nobody right. would, you know, take the time to find out if that's a good idea. So, yes, we all have biases. So it, it's it's identifying it. It's being self-aware enough to say, oh, I just did that, right? And 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 kind of admitting that that we have that and just putting it out on the table. That's the start. So you you you're giving your example, but uh, as a company, Red Hat, mm -hmm. is there any at the organization level to kind of uh, fix the problem? Or? Huge. So this has become a massive focus at Red Hat. Um, and I, some of it is just natural because of our culture. Um, I mean, we have a very open... Right, very diverse. And um, very, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess, yeah, diverse is a good word, but I mean, we do come from the open source culture, so you're going to have some inherent, you know, kind of um, cultural aspects from that. So it, it has been a very intentional um, uh, motion to say, how do we get younger, more diverse, more global. I think it also helps when you enable a distributed organization. So as we have grown, we've become more global. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have large offices now in India, in um, Israel, in Czech Republic, in you know, a lot of very different places. So at any given moment, I'm talking to people on every time zone around right, the world right. from all different backgrounds, which by the way, we do all speak English most of the time. So there is that mm -hmm. bias, you could say. Right, right. Um, but I think that forces you um, to, to kind of put those biases on the table and figure out, okay, these people are so smart, they're coming from these different areas, but together, let's figure out how to make this work and be successful. Yeah, I, and hopefully, because the, a lot of efforts are not going on, so hopefully, yeah. you know, we will, I mean, it's a long battle, but it, it is a long battle, but I think it's just, we can't stop talking about it. Yes. And um, I'm excited. I mean, I, I love working for Red Hat because we are talking about it so much. And I do see us making a huge difference. Mm. Uh, and they allow me to go out and, and, and be, a, be a role model and do those things um, and, and try to make a change in the industry overall. And yeah, I, and I, I totally agree with you. And thanks for talking Thank to me you. today. It's and great by, to meet yeah, you. It was, it was. Thank you. Thank you.